Ladies and gentlemen, very quickly moving on to the next conversation that we are going to have. The conversation is going to be moderated by our next speaker, Mr. Anant Rangaswamy, the editor of Melt on Weon. Advisor on Metric, former editor storyboard, he was earlier the founding editor of Campaign India magazine. Anant has over 23 years of experience in media and advertising. Sir, may I please request you to kindly join us on stage. And ladies and gentlemen, sharing the stage and the dais with Anant is our next speaker, Sir Martin Sorel, the executive chairman of S4 Capital, that is building a new age, new era digital advertising and marketing services platform for clients. As CEO of WPP for 33 years, Sir Martin helped build it from one million shell company, one million pounds shell company to in 1985 into the world's largest advertising and marketing services company with a market capitalization of over 16 billion pounds My revenue God. of Sorry? over 15 billion pounds profits of approximately 2 billion pounds and over 200,000 people in 113 countries sir martin supports a number of leading business schools and universities including his alma mater the harvard business School and Cambridge University and a number of charities including his family foundation. Sirs, it is indeed an honor to have you with us and it's over to you now Mr. Thank Anand. you very Please much. take it away. So Anand, are we going to beat the system? I, I think we will and the first thing we do is break away from the script and the topic. Yeah, so, no, well, so, so we, we've been told not to go into a Q&A session. <clears throat> so if Anna and I get told not to do something, we go the opposite direction. So if anybody wants to ask Anna or me a question, if you go on to sms142 at gmail.com, I will pick up your question, and after we've had an initial discussion for 20 or so minutes, we'll, we'll try and deal with some questions. So feel free to ask the questions. We will vet them obviously, uh, right. before we Perfect. get into Anna. So, uh, this morning, uh, Mr. Bachan told us an absolutely lovely story about how his father uh, knocked off the Srivastava from his name uh, because he didn't want his name to, you know, shout out his caste and made it Harvans Rai Bachan. And unknown to most of you, Sir Martin's got a very familiar, very similar story. So what I'm going to ask him is what his favorite book is. <laughs> so that's how we're going to start this conversation. What's your favorite book, Martin? Well, there was a, there was a book called Sorrel and Son. Right. And it was written by a man called Warwick Deeping. <clears throat> it was actually made into a series by the BBC, which was about a butler. So it was a bit like upstairs, downstairs, or Downton Abbey. He had a butler who privately educated his son, and really the story was about a relationship between father and son. And in the, this is quite an interesting story in the sense that it's quite timely. Some of you may have read that uh, I think 24 hours ago, a group of seven Labour MPs left the Labour Party in the UK, partly because of Brexit, it's true, but partly because of anti-Semitism, uh, in the Labour Party. And in the 1920s, when my father was living in London, his parents came from the Ukraine in 1899, not speaking a word of English, they were living in the East End. He, he was starting his career as a sort of barrack room lawyer, and um, there was a lot of anti-Semitism, so he changed his name from the Russian name so, to Sorrel, because he loved the book, and thought it would be a good name. So I, I think the first time Martin told me the story, it was more fun. He said his father was walking past a bookshop and he saw this book in a store window and that's how he got his name, Sorel. That's how they got the family name, Sorel. So and that's how we got S4 capital because S stands for four generations of oh, Sorrels to remind me of my immigrant background. Right, so now we move on from the trivia to the new reality. The old reality was WPP and the new reality is, is S4 Capital. So what's the difference, Martin? What is the new reality? Um, well, it, 
When I, when I left WPP, I looked at, WPP consisted of a $20 billion portfolio of revenue. And I looked down and to where I, I saw the growth. And the reason for that was <clears throat> McKinsey, I remember, did an article three or four years ago. They looked at the S&P 500, the FTSE 100, at the companies that had survived. You know, you go back 30 years and a very few, I can't remember how many, of the S&P 500 or the FTSE 100 survived today. What was the reason uh, for their survival? So the article went through. It was not because of the quality of the CEO, unfortunately. It wasn't. It was not because of cost cutting, fortunately. It was because of revenue growth. So the thesis of the article and the work was you push on the open door. You go where the opportunity was. So I looked at the 20 billion, and of course WPP's portfolio had been flat for a year or so in terms of organic growth. And there were three areas of significant growth. Some was up, some was down, but there were three areas of significant growth. The first was in digital content. Um, companies like AKQA, VML, Wonderman, what used to be called Ogle V1, these companies consistently grew through the cycles and through the secular growth that we witnessed, obviously, through digital. Second area was data. Not the cousin, of course, here in India, uh, Kantar has a very significant base, as you know, in media measurement, custom research, and panel research. But it was the panel continuous data. So around Kantar World Panel or Lightspeed, the online panel, where we saw significant growth. That was the second area. And the third area was media planning and buying, uh, digital media planning and buying, online. So Essence, which is effectively Google's digital media partner, uh, Zaxis, both in its transparent model, so-called, and non-transparent model, so-called. So those were the three areas. And then if you put the three together, and somewhat irreverently we call it the holy trinity. You have data, first party data at the core, driving digital content, and driving media planning and buying, particularly programmatic. One of the surveys that I saw, or, or uh, parts of newspapers I saw around this conference, had a big article on the importance of programmatic in the context of the World Cup, not the football World Cup, the cricket World Cup here in India. So clearly, first party data is driving content and media, but for a very good reason. With the rise of the platforms, with the rise of Google, Facebook, Amazon, the three major platforms, supplemented by Alibaba and Tencent, so let's call them the five platforms, including the two Chinese, control of data and influence of data, particularly first party data, is critically important. That's the battlefield. That is where the battle will be won or lost. You know, if you go back to 2000 or into the 1990s, the rise of the internet gave manufacturers the opportunity the first time for many years to build a relationship with the consumers, or so the manufacturers thought. So the, the position of a Tesco or Walmart or a Carrefour was undermined by the growth of internet connection to the consumer. Along comes the e-tailers, such as Google and Facebook, and particularly Amazon, Alibaba, and Tencent, and undermine this thesis. And with the growth of fake news, the privacy, brand safety, political interference debates that have bedeviled Google and Facebook, uh, and to some extent Amazon recently, there's been a tremendous focus on privacy in that point. And that has driven the platforms to put the walled gardens, the walls in the walled gardens, higher. And that has really concerned our clients, I think, and they've been very worried about it. And they, the importance of first party data linked to content and digital media becomes even more important. The best example that I've come across, and I have my colleagues here from Media Monks, Victor, uh, with me here in, in India as we are uh, on the cusp of opening up 
S4 capital and media months here uh, in India in the next few days. As we look at the, the model that is most appropriate for what I'm talking about, one of the most, not the only one, would be a Netflix type model, where we take the content, we develop the content in many ways, creatively inserting content into digital masters such as Narcos, and then we feed that content into programmatic media buying, depending on the behavior of the consumer. So this model, driven by data, is critically important. S4 Capital is purely about digital, so we're very focused on the 40% of client budgets, or around that, that suffuses digital at the moment. So the world, the industry is about one trillion. I know there was a broker's circular that came out recently that pegged it at 1.7 trillion as a market. It's an important point to make. The additional 700 billion came mainly from trade budgets, about 400 billion. That 400 billion is the stuff that Amazon goes after. That is the battleground for Amazon in developing its, its, trade bu it, its advertising budgets through the trade budgets of clients. But if you take the one trillion basic, which is certainly what Group M would, would peg the market at, about half of that is in old stuff, traditional stuff, and a half in new stuff. And digital is around 200 billion of that, that trillion. And of course, the dominant players in that are Google, last year at about 125, Facebook at about 52 billion, and then you drop down to Amazon and Microsoft at about 10 billion each. So that gives you a rough idea of the dynamics, yeah. but that's where we're totally focused on with that holy trinity, as yeah. I put it. Martin, you've run out of your quota for plugging your company. <laughs> now, you know, I, think, I think now move on to uh, you know, conversations we've had outside of this hall today. The one word which kept popping up, and perhaps it came up in Mr. Button's speech this morning and so on, was transparency. How is transparency going to change the business? How is it already changing the business? Well, the, the need for transparency, more than transparency. I India is, a, to my mind, a really interesting market from a number of points of view. I mean, I've been coming here uh, on and off for about 30, 33, 35 years. Um, and uh, the business that WPP here is dominant. It's not the largest market share that WPP has in the world. I think that probably would be Vietnam. But it's roughly about 50% of the market, partly because of the wonderful brands in India that have been developed at J. Walter Thompson, at Ogilvy and beyond, and obviously in more recent years with Group M. But very strong brands here in India. But the Indian market is still what I would call quite traditional or more traditional than you see in other markets. And what you see going on in other markets in the agencies as they come under pressure is two sort of different strategies. You've seen what I would call the consolidators, and I would put Publicis and WPP as the consolidators, where they're consolidating brands to simplify. Now, there's a danger in doing that, because it sort of it reminds me of uh, sort of spreadsheet management or seagull management. I won't go into what the real description of seagull management yes. is. I'll leave that to the, the fer fertile imagination of the audience. But these, these are simplistic answers to strategic and structural issues that may or may not be right. But you have consolidators like Publicis uh, and WPP, and then you have probably two other agency groups, Omnicom and IPG, who are focused more on investing in their individual brands and not bringing them together. The net result of that, and this is the big analyst, stock market analyst question, is why is it that both of the consolidators aren't doing very well, whilst the ones, the two companies investing in their brands, IPG and Omnicom, see from their latest results are doing you much better. Again soon, that. Well, I'll come back to Dentsu, because yeah, I think sure. it's slightly, slightly different. And the reason is, I think, the consolidators, it takes time for the strategy to implement. I mean, when you, when you put Publicis' name on top of an agency creative group, the natural result is that Saatchi loses traction, 
BBH loses traction and Burnett loses traction. Or if you put Sapient on top <coughs> of digital brands like Razorfish, Rosetta, LBI, and Digitas, they go. So one plus one may not equal two or one and a half or even one, certainly in the short term. And I think that's what's, that would be my explanation of what's happening. Whereas the companies, IPG and Omnicom, that are investing in their brands certainly get a short-term benefit, but the long-term question is whether the, that, that strategically is the right thing to do to leaving these businesses as relatively independent verticals. So interesting strategic issue. Now you raised the question, the other two, Havas has disappeared into Vivendi. It's very difficult to figure out what How they're doing, the although the claim results businesses. recently were, were quite good. Yeah. Dentsu is really interesting to me because it is the closest to the S4 capital model. Dentsu's strengths emanate from Japanese media. It is still basically a media planning and buying organization, but it, it has developed its digital capabilities to a sophisticated degree, and thirdly, it developed its data business. They may have paid too much for Merkel, they paid about $1.7 billion for it, which probably was about... When, when will you stop saying they paid too much for it? <laughs> when people don't ask me questions about it. But it may have paid too much for it, but it, actually it's a great asset, and it has first-party data, which, thinking about the model that I talked about in the context of S4 Capital, is really important. So I think that's the, that's the territory. Now, on this question of transparency in India, I think the market in India will change. I think clients are increasingly becoming concerned about transparency, not just on the content side, <clears throat> but on the media side too. With Media Monks, which is our content delivery, we're quite clear on the model. Faster, better, cheaper. Faster means that in our 24-7, always-on world, you're really running political campaigns. And we're not running old-style tentpole campaigns around big ideas. You have your big ideas, but you're implementing them and it's an iterative program, pro, uh, process. You get data, which informs content and media. You get the data back on how effective they are, and you, you reiterate the process and improve the content and the media delivery. This is the critical point. So I think transparency on content is clear. What we have still to work out on is what is going to happen on the media side. We think clients will demand, even in the Indian market, more transparency Martin, why and less say, opacity. Why, why you say, and I think this will be important for Mighty Hat. Even in the Indian market, you use the word even there. Yeah. Why did you use the word even? Well, I think India has tended to be more tra traditional. I mean, we were talking this morning with newspaper owners about how do newspaper owners deal with digital transformation. Um, a number of the media owners, I think newspaper owners, traditional owners, still think that newspapers and magazines will continue to play the role in the future that they have in the past in the Indian market. That is not the case that right. we see outside India. Sure. By and large, you know, felling trees and distributing newsprint is not a socially desirable process, and it may not be a particularly efficient process when you have digital devices. Right. And its question is, as you and I discussed earlier today with, with several of them, is how do you develop the digital model in an effective way, just like for agencies? How do we develop S4 Capital, which is purely digital, unitary in structure, no earnouts? The, the, key, the key players in the company have very significant equity interests in the company, which is worth something like $600 million market cap already. How, did, how do we develop that business in a unitary way, faster, meaning always on, Better using technology effectively and cheaper, and cheaper being more now, efficient. I'm going to pull you back uh, for you to throw a little more light on transparency. If you go back 25 years, if there was a client of any agency, he or she did not think that the agency was not being transparent. Why are we talking transparency well, now? I think since 2008, there's been a fundamental difference in the way the economy has worked and therefore our, our clients have thought about things. If you look at GDP growth since 2008, it basically has been lower in nominal terms than before 2008. The reason for that is there's broadly been less inflation, for whatever reason. 
Maybe it's the growth of technology. Maybe, I mean, you would have thought with easy money there would have been more inflation, <clears throat> but maybe primarily because of technology, and we've seen it with the rise of populism, that's a reaction or a, a symptom of what I'm talking about, the threat to employment and the, the lack of improvement in real incomes has meant that inflation has been under control. And that has meant that clients have had less pricing power and the rise of finance and procurement. Right. Despite the fact that I was a finance director, I'm not an accountant or a bean counter, but despite, despite the fact that I was a finance director, you're, you're, uh, not, you're not, I, you're not I one be, anymore? No. I bemoan, so I'm, a, I'm Is a, Victor alone? Victor? I, I, no, Victor is, is, is Victor a, a CEO of Media Minds. Right. So, despite the fact that I have that background, I, to some extent, bemoan the rise of finance and procurement and its impact on the marketing function. Remember so the why McKinsey... Was that, why was that born, Martin? Why was procurement born? Well, procurement was born because, because clients in that environment, particularly in recent years, when they've seen GDP growth under, not pressure, but right. not as so fulsome Easy. as it was in I mean, the, the, part, the region, the region of the world where our clients do best from a pricing point of view is Latin America. Right. Why? General levels of inflation, even post-2008, have been great. It gives more wiggle room and more flexibility. In the environment we see, there's more pressure inside the organization at lower uh, nominal nominal growth rates. And that's meant clients have had to look at their procedures, understandably, I'm not moaning about it, understandably in a more effective way. And that's the reason. And so we've had to become much more conscious of cost and efficiency. And that's why the old models are so challenged at the moment. You know, the overhead levels built into it. Look at how it's all le legacy costs. How do agents, exactly, how do agencies charge for their, their fees? Direct costs, they load in indirect costs, and they add profit. If that, that was your formula. If your directs and indirects are lower, certainly if your indirects are lower, you obviously have a competitive advantage. And a company that starts from scratch, as S4 Capital did, last year, as Media Monks did about 15 or 16 years ago, as Mighty Hive did six or seven years ago, where they start, there is much more opportunity to be more flexible in pricing. There's another thing here. As we built those agencies around clients, I think it had an unintended consequence. And that was clients felt that they were becoming more and more dependent on the agency, and as their resources have been put under pressure. They put you under pressure as well. They, they put us under pressure, but they, they felt denuded of resource. So go back to the wall gardens. There you have Google and Facebook, understandably, I'm not criticizing, understandably saying, we're not gonna share our data with you. Clients becoming concerned about that relationship with the consumer, looking at the first party data they have, looking at content and media, building the model, <coughs> <clears throat> and saying, we don't have enough internal resource to service what we need to do. We've denuded ourselves of resource. So they've become insecure. <clears throat> there is a strange comparison to Brexit. I was watching a film uh, on the Brexit campaign, which the tagline of which was take back control. Dominic right. Cumberpatch played Dominic Cummings, I think his name it was, who ran the campaign. That was the tagline that he came up with. That, to my mind, is exactly what we're seeing with our clients. They want to take, to back, take control. back control of things that for maybe wise reasons at the time, but now in this new environment, this new reality, they have to have exert more control on. So in housing, there's another issue here that's really important. Clients think, and there has been a lack of trust, you know, whether we look at the, what's happened with the American advertising, uh, and the, the, yeah. the, the four A's, uh, and with the, with the client organizations as well, with the World Federation of Advertisers, there's been a concern that the agencies were more about promoting their interests than the client's interests. And incumbency, and there was a feeling that all agencies wanted was more incumbency. When we in-house, for example, through Mighty Hive, or we create studios through Media Monks, co-located with clients, 
or even part of the client structure, that takes out of the, the equation. The between the two. Yeah. Yeah. And clients, I think, genuinely feel that what we're interested in is their interest 150% rather than maybe 50% their interest and 50% ours. So do you think in a country like India, uh, a country that you know well, we'll see more small outfits being born and challenging the legacy agencies? Well, it's an interesting... Obviously, you know, we will be launching our operation here in India very shortly, imminently, <coughs> starting in the content area. And we've looked at it, obviously, from an acquisition point of view. There are a number of small units, small agencies, successful agencies, good agencies, but they are small scale. And I often ask myself, why is that the case? And I, I think, I don't think I'm being too optimistic, that we're in the foothills of this, these developments. We're at the very start. And it's rather like 1985 when we started wire and plastic products and we started on what was called below the line areas, promotions, design, unfashionable. You know, the Don Drapers of the world looked down their nose, even at media, right. looked down their nose and said, that's not for us. We don't want to get our hands dirty. We want to focus on the big creative stuff. And I think the same thing is true of, of digital. Although it's very different to below the line in terms of status and importance. And in terms of budgets. And in terms of budgets. Sure. What I think is happening is we're in the foothills of it, and what you're going to see is greater consolidation. Now, Amitabh this morning talked about brand India, Dharm of India, and he talked about it. It's not snake charmers. It's around tech and pharmaceutical, doctors, talent, whatever. And I think he's absolutely on, on the money there. So India, although its media sort of pattern is more traditional than you would find outside in many markets, the fact that India will be the most populous country on the planet, and you know, I, I, I don't say this just because I'm sitting here at the IAA, no, but, but I've said consistently over the 30 years I've come here, if our businesses outside India were as good as India in terms of quality of talent, I could have retired a long time ago. Would, I you, think would that, you have? What? Would you ever no, I would never have. It's yeah, just a throwaway have. line. But the, there's a truth in what I, I, I said. I do really believe that the quality of the people is so good that, and the technical capability is so good in a Bangalore, matching not as good as some areas of the world. He, he like gave you a hint Bangalore. there. He, he might be opening in Bangalore. A but, small hint. He didn't talk about any other... We Indian will open in Bangalore, Bangalore and we will open in Mumbai as well. Right. But, you know, the Bangalore tech capability is as good as you will find elsewhere. The quality is good. So my sense is that what you see in the foothills here in India will grow, and they will grow into mountains, or whatever the right analogy is, quite quickly. Perfect. And uh, on that note of optimism, uh, we'll sort of wrap up. Uh, I'm going to ask Martin to give us one more line on the young, for the young people sitting in the back, uh, should they get into the business of advertising, media, and marketing? Just uh, answer that one for, for the young people sitting right at the back. I, I think the answer to that is quite definitely yes. Right. I think actually the position of the industry, we should be more optimistic. If I think back 10, 15, 20 years ago, our position versus a McKinsey or a Goldman Sachs in terms of recruitment was inferior to where it is now. The fact that you know our, our biggest customers are S4 Capital are all tech companies. Our two biggest are two of the, what I call the seven sisters. Um, the fact that if you look at our top 10 or 20 clients, it's peppered with high tech clients, gives us a relatively stronger position to attract young talent and to be attractive to young talent than ever before. Average age of Mighty Hive, the 300 employees in my dive is about 25. Right. Average life of the 900, 950 at Media Monks is about 33. So these are bodies of people that are really enthusiastic about new technology. I mean, Media Monks virtually has, has very few traditional agency people. Mighty Hive has none. 
the founders of Mighty Hive come out of Google and Yahoo and Salesforce. They come out of the tech companies, what I call the, the, the big seven. 10 companies, you know, an Oracle and Adobe, a Salesforce, and Apple and Microsoft, and then the big five, Google, yeah. Amazon, Facebook, Tencent, and Alibaba. That's where they come from. And I think actually we're more attractive now to younger talent than we've ever been. <clears throat> and I was talking to Kai-Fu Lee, who's, one of, who's the guy who's written, the Chinese guy who's written a, a, a seminal book on AI, <clears throat> artificial intelligence. And he is one of three of the big VCs in China. Um, Hugo Shong is another. The guy from Silver Lake, whose name I can't remember, is the, is the third. And Kai-Fu Lee has a really interesting model. <clears throat> he has about 300 software engineers. He has a diversified portfolio of VC and private equity investments in China. His portfolio is, is assisted by 300 software engineers. He has a university <clears throat> of about 700, 800 people, and he goes to the Chinese universities, <clears throat> usually in year two or year three, interviews them before they've seen Alibaba and Tencent, Right. because he gets to them early, because once they've seen Alibaba and Tencent, they're sold on them and they're, they're gone, and recruits them, I think, summer jobs or whatever, puts them into the university and then takes the best. In a funny way, it's what we did in China uh, with our design school in Shanghai, or what we did with the red and yellow uh, uh, center school in South Africa, and what we did here in, in India. India with, yeah, what we did here in ISDN, India as well. Yeah, ISDN, with the design yeah. school and the advertising school, to try and get young talent early before Apple, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Amazon had got to them, right. uh, and, and un make them understand the technological applications of what we're, what we're doing. Anyway, on that note of optimism, I think Mr. Bachchan ended with optimism, so does Martin. All you young people at the back, there's a good business to get into, and now <laughs> let's have a look at so we've whether got we've got any questions at all. Um, I've got an invitation to a meeting. Hold on, here we go. Question. Between the brand born of traditional advertising and one born in a digital-led area, traditional brands of agencies are the brand story initiators, whereas in the new digital area, brands are constantly evolving a part of the digital conversation. How should a company prepare itself for this constant digital alertness and being proactive in, this, in these conversations? How should companies work to constantly listen and respond? Well, good, good, long question, but good question. Um, and I think this is a critical issue. Everybody in this room who's running a campaign in a always-on, 24-7 world, in my view, is running a political campaign. So this is like advising Prime Minister Modi or the Congress Party on a political campaign, but without an election date. Right, sure. This is forever. So you've got a lot of outbounds, you've got a lot of proactivity in the campaign, but you've got a lot of inbound as well. And you have to react and change on a continuous basis. So these are not tempo conversations or campaigns. These are not, two CEOs of major packaged goods companies in the last week have said to me, we don't do any fixed big budget campaigns anymore. What we do is continuously produce content on a 24-7 proactive and reactive basis, and it's that iterative process I mentioned, sometimes modified, modified by first-party data. And I have to say that first-party data is very difficult because most legacy companies have different systems, different IT systems, and combining the data across all their platforms is very difficult, and they've made acquisitions which make it m even more difficult. So I think, uh, this is in response to John Joseph, I think that is an issue uh, that is really important. Got more time? I think, no, we've got one question, I think. We have run out of time, so I think just the one question. One more. Okay, Niraj Roy, with clients wanting to take back control, what is to say that data privacy will not be at risk with 1,000 brands as opposed to the five key platforms that currently dominate the global marketplace? I think that's true. It is a big concern. But I think what we have to do, and we failed to do this as an industry. I was at Phoenix last week with the IAB, 
and it was a long time since I'd been with Randy Rothenberg, and I remember we went to Brussels many years ago to try and get the European Commission to agree to an opt-out process with the consumer. That has gone. Concern about fake news, brand safety, privacy, all these issues, interference into political elections, all these things, have meant that opt-in is the only way that we can work with the consumer. But what we have to do is to simply explain to the consumer in simple terms what he or she is letting themselves in for when they accept and agree to, the to have a conversation with them. Right. That's the critical issue. And it has to be done simply. I mean, we overlay so much of our conversations are too complicated. Let me just, you know, I know that Dharm is an important part, the central point of this conference. But we overcomplicate the purpose issue. It's very simple. If you're in business for the long term, you will embrace purpose and you will not aggravate or alienate your key stakeholders right. by doing things in the short term that are your, to your advantage but not to not the advantage to of society. Right. Same thing with privacy. We complicate it. It's very simple. The consumer wishes to be informed about what he or she is letting herself in for. Or himself or yes. herself into and not to be surprised. Perfect. On that note, thank you so much. We've run out of time, but those who do want, you can bump into Martin and, and ask him a question outside as he's walking around. Yes, Kubra, sorry to overrun. Thank you very, very much, gentlemen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm now going to invite on stage Mr. Arun Puri, the founder, publisher of the India Today Group, to kindly present both these wonderful gentlemen with a token of appreciation. A very warm welcome to you, Mr. Puri. And thank you so much for that wonderful conversation. Please don't leave yet because we've got something supremely amazing coming up on the grand stage right now. Right after the mementos are presented. So may I please request our audience to kindly remain seated. Gentlemen, thank you so very much.